Hey guys, it's Debbie and I am talking to Emily Warner today. She is a sports dietitian, works with the NBA uh, Philadelphia 76ers as a team dietitian, and she works with Timeline Nutrition. So I'm going to talk about Timeline Nutrition because I've been curious about this supplement. Clinically proven to revitalize mitochondria and boost muscle function, taking two soft gels a day. Now, it gets confusing out there. If you listen to podcasts and YouTube channels, these little guys, should you take a supplement to help your mitochondria? When should you do it? How long should you go on it for? And when are you taking too many supplements? I think a lot of people listen to all this information and they hear this, take this, take that. And then we end up with a cabinet filled with supplements. Are you one of those people? I know I have supplements in my basket drawer, in my bathroom and in my closet. And then I have a bunch in the kitchen and I'm trying to get rid of, finish what I have before I start more stuff and not buy everything you hear about because it gets overwhelming. And my mantra as I get older, less is more, more is not better. And sometimes I'm, I'm finding with clients that we need to address health issues first. So instead of taking all this anti-aging longevity supplementation, why don't we test and not guess, as I always say, as a health practitioner, investigate what's going on internally. Even if you don't have a lot of symptoms, you might not know that there's stuff going on because the symptoms can be far removed from where the actual dysfunction imbalance is. So if you have H. pylori, you're probably going to have poor digestion issues and low gut, good gut bacteria and overgrowth of bad bacteria and all sorts of things can happen as a result from H. pylori, for example. And then we have just stress in our lives and we are exercising a lot. And if you're exercising long distance and then you put that into hot weather, we're really putting a lot of stress and oxidative stress on our body. So if you're like me and you're training to be your best future self, so when I'm 70, 80, 90 years old, I'm thriving and not struggling to survive the day. So I was curious to learn more about MitoPure and the science behind it, as well as looking at other longevity hacks, so to speak, that we can do and lifestyle habits to implement into our day. And I think MitoPure is Timeline Nutrition is one company to talk to, and then we'll talk to Quality of Mind in a month and learn more about other solutions. But I don't think you can out supplement poor lifestyle habits. I don't think you can out exercise poor nutrition habits. I was at the gym this morning, a new gym lifting weights, doing my workout, and I noticed how many people, not judging, but just a good example of how many people are just heavier even though they're working out because they're not working on the other things. So let's talk to Emily and learn more about her philosophy and how we can get better for performing our best today and our future selves. Hold on. All right, I've got Dr. Emily back on and we're going to talk shop about how we can improve our health performance and longevity as an athlete, and we're more endurance athletes, but I wanted to bring Dr. Emily on the show to talk about her experience, your knowledge, and also what we can do to improve our future self. So thank you for making time for me today to share your wisdom. Absolutely. Happy to be here. Now you work with the NBA as a team dietitian, and you're working as a consultant for Timeline Nutrition. So how do you why do you do what you do and how do you fit it all in? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I do what I do because I, first of all, I love school. So going through and getting a PhD and like thought I'd be in research and academia forever. Um, and I have a strong love for research and learning as much as we possibly can about the human body. Um, so that was what kind of started my love of just understanding how exercise and nutrition kind of play together. Um, as an athlete myself growing up, like I never had a nutrition talk from a coach. I, no one ever explained to me the importance of how the food that you eat is literally the fuel for everything that you do. Yeah. So it's like, it's one of those, if I wish, I wish I knew then what I know now, I probably would have been a 10 times better athlete, but, uh, that's what I say. Yeah. yeah. So it was, 
it was that passion for learning that pushed me along the academic path that I did. And then certain relationships I built along the way and opportunities that arose are what got me into being a team dietitian, which means just like focusing on one specific group of athletes, one specific sport, and just optimizing everything for those individuals. Mm -hmm. Um, I personally like working with basketball because it's what I played my entire life. So it's a, it's a sport. I understand it's a a culture. I understand. Um, and you know, it's, it's exciting to me to be able to work with these athletes who are literally like top 1% in the world of as far as humans go. So, um, so it's been a, it's been a really cool journey. And then where timeline nutrition comes in was, serendipity you know we we kind of uh became aware of each other at the same time and they really loved my path and my um my expertise and my passion for all of this and they were like you know we're we'd really love to have somebody to help translate our science because it's it's kind of hefty like there there's a lot of a lot of science behind the product um he's like they're like we need help translating that to the practitioner um and so that's how I began consulting with them and here we are that's great yeah, I think it's so important to follow your passion, right? That's what I I would say. What I've learned in my field is in my background, is Ironman, triathlons, and marathons, and working with athletes. But just following your passion and your purpose, and fo- having a mission for that. So it sounds like you're on that path and combining all of what you love together. So that's really exciting. Yeah, I'm trying to. It's it, a lot of people will ask me like, "How did you do school for so long?" I'm like, "Well, I loved it." They're like, well, should I do a PhD? And I'm like, do you love research? Do you uh-huh. love like sitting at your computer for 14 hours a day? Like Ooh. if you, you know, it, yeah. it's a, it's a grind, but yeah, you're right. If you find something that you love, it's a lot easier to, to stay on that path. Mm-hmm. And, but even if you don't do PhD, which is very uh, in depth and, and exhausting, I would think, but it's, I always am continuing in educational programs as I'm finishing Dr. Stacy Sims course on training for the menopausal woman. And now I have this wild health program on genetics that I paid for. So I got to start doing that. And then I yep. metabolic expert. So it's just, you know, even though I'm not officially in school, I'm in my own school of Debbie. <laughs> that <laughs> it's like continuously signing up for something. So it's, I, it never ends when you love what you do. And it's, there's always so much to learn and grow. It's just never ending. Absolutely. Do all this. So in that longevity, as we talk about optimizing our health, I would say taking ownership of our health and really doing what we can do today to improve how we are 20, 30, 40 years from now working on our future self. And why do you think that's important as athletes? They think, I feel like we're always thinking we're invincible because we're fit and we're active, but we're not always healthy from the inside out. So What, why should we, what do you see, I guess, in athletes of all different sports that's common like going yeah. on inside that we're not doing to take ownership to improve our future self? I think, I mean, my field or my specialty in particular, these, these elite male athletes, um, especially the younger ones, like, like you just said, they think they're invinci- invincible. They're like, I can spend three hours on the court and go eat five guys for dinner and then do it again the next day. And like, and I feel fine and I'm not sore and da, 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 da. But then you start to get the, the middle-aged more athletes and like, which in the NBA is like late twenties, yeah, <laughs> 30, 30, 30 is even kind of old. Like, cause my athletes range in age from 20 to 37 is my range. So mm-hmm. So kind of in that middle crew, they're like, ah, oh, start, it's starting to start to feel it a little bit like, you know, and then plus in their off time, they just sit around and play video games or, you know, they're not super active in general. So the messaging that I always try to say to them is like, you, you may feel good now and that's wonderful. And that probably means nothing terrible is going on, but that doesn't mean you haven't started this trickle down effect of negative outcomes, or you haven't done anything to moderate the decline that is inevitable. Like we all age, we literally cannot stop it. And what we, but what we can do is there's this kind of, um, there's a health health span versus lifespan difference, right? So everybody has a lifespan, which is just how long you live. And then there's health span, which is for how long you can stay healthy during Mm -hmm. your life. And the, the sooner and the more proactive that you are about emphasizing your health span and, um, you know, the exercise appropriate diet, those kinds of things that's going to 
extend the health span and just kind of help slow that inevitable decline, I guess. Mm -hmm. So how does mitochondria health come into the role of longevity? How do you (laughs) tie that in and nutrition, I guess? Yeah. I mean, mitochondria are at the base of, of everything. Um, all of the cells in your body, except for red blood cells contain mitochondria in the thousands, right? So their role in the cell is, I mean, it has hundreds of responsibilities and the primary one being that of energy production. So all of the substrates that we consume eventually pass through the mitochondria for conversion into ATP, which is our energy source. What happens as we age and also as we incur stress, so it's happening from the beginning, is our mitochondria, they have a life cycle of their own and they become kind of malfunctioning in different aspects of what their responsibilities are. So they could be malfunctioning in a a dozen different ways, but at the end of it, it comes down to some sort of dysfunction. And that happens more pronounced as we age. And the problem with that is if the mitochondria are dysfunctional, they just can't do their job as well. It's like, imagine, you know, you have this brand new dishwasher and it works perfectly for however many years, but eventually you're like, oh, my dishes are starting to not be as clean as they used to be. And then that decline just continues until the point that you need to fully replace that dishwasher and the mitochondria are the same. That's funny. That's our dishwasher, we've lived here three years and I'm looking at the dishwasher and the washing machine. So it's, yeah. So what, what could we do with, I want to dive into mitochondria health and how to improve it with a big topic is fasting. The other thing mm-hmm. is nutrition and then the benefits of exercise to help mitochondria. And then when do we supplement? So yeah, why don't I guess talk with nutrition first, if is there anything we can do to help get rid of the old mitochondria and get some new ones, how do we Yeah. So, so the mitochondria have their own life cycle. Um, just naturally our bodies do this and it's kind of, they have, there's different phases of it, um, where essentially there's a quality control mechanism that determines as a mitochondria becomes dysfunctional, do we break it apart and fuse it with other pieces of mitochondria to create new mitochondria, which is that mitochondrial biogenesis. If anybody's heard of that, um, there's also the option to break the mitochondria apart and just clear out that debris if there's no way to salvage it. If it's too far gone, if it just needs to be cleared out. And then if you can clear out the debris, you can make room for new mitochondria. So the ways in which we can affect this with nutrition, um, there are a few ways. So first of all, fasting. Um, There's a good amount of research showing that fasting for that it's really mixed on like how much fasting actually needs to occur and what effects it's going to have. The way that I kind of look at it is a reminder that we as human beings are not meant to be constantly fed. We are, we, our bodies were not meant to be constantly full of substrate for use for energy. Like evolutionarily, there were time periods of some long, some short of fasting. Um, and our mitochondria developed mechanisms to revamp themselves in those times of fasting because they needed to stay alive. So for that reason, and, and I'm not super versed on the mechanisms behind the fasting and the mitochondrial health, but what we have seen is that primarily fasting can induce that mitophagy process, which is, um, that clearance of the debris, so that, so that recycling can continue onwards. Mm-hmm. Um, additionally to fasting consumption of, you know, fruits and vegetables that has the, the polyphenols, um, that's been shown to be just good for health in general. Um, and in addition to mitochondrial health, cause the thing with mitochondria is that they, in addition to processing, like the substrates that we use to create energy, they actually give off their own waste product called a reactive oxygen species. And that can lead to inflammation and some level of reactive oxygen species is necessary actually to like trigger some processes that are good for us, but too much reactive oxygen species leads to negative inflammation and negative health outcomes. 
So the mitochondria are doing this on their own naturally, but having polyphenols present to help clear out that excess reactive oxygen species can help moderate the amount of inflammation that is caused and kind of reduce it essentially. Um, so yeah, that's it's just a goldie. It's always the Goldilocks effect for everything. Not too much, not too little, just the right amount, create that positive effective exactly, dose. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why, you know, there's been some research that shows too much antioxidant intake in athletes is actually inhibitory to performance. So yeah, the Goldilocks paradox is like a perfect way to put it. Um, and then specifically within the polyphenol called elegitanins is this nutrient called urolithin A. And that nutrient specifically can induce that mitophagy process. So there's, I mean, there's a, like 8,000 different polyphenols, right? And so research is still ongoing about what they all do, what they can do. And one that has been identified to specifically target the mitochondria is urolithin A. So is that consult- recently discovered? Cause I know when my, this timeline nutrition came out, it was like this new thing that was talking yeah. about. So your lipin A as a molecule was discovered about 40 years ago, give or take a couple mm-hmm. years. Um, but the, the research on it, like the true human clinical trials is 15 years old, not even, um, and might appear the product from timeline nutrition was just launched in 2020. Yeah. So three quite years. New. Yeah. I remember yeah. when it came out. So the fasting of fed, that's always a big thing for mitophagy cleaning out the dead cell autophagy, but also the mitochondria. And then, so fasting and then eating the fed part is eating more polyphenols and getting the nutrients you need to help get rid of or help support the mitochondria. I mean, yep. it seems like exercise more so is beneficial for growing more mitochondria. And then the fasted fed is good for getting rid of the dead ones. That's probably a good, simple way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there's, there's definitely a good amount of research on the effect that exercise has on the mitochondria as far as promoting mitochondrial biogenesis. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you can only, there's only so much space in a cell, right? So if you're not clearing yeah. out the dysfunctional and promoting mitophagy, biogenesis can only happen to a certain extent, but we know this because in muscle biopsies, you can tell an athlete versus a non-athlete or somebody that's trained versus untrained because of the mitochondrial density in their muscles. When they do a muscle, do they, to do that, do they take like a giant needle? I heard it's really painful. I remember when they were doing the faster study, they'd have to do the muscle biopsy. I've never done one. I've always wanted to, but yeah. So it's essentially like a, um, they need to take a piece of the muscle about the size of a grain of rice. So imagine a needle that can penetrate the, the muscle that in that like thickness, that diameter, and then they kind of like clip it and like pull it out. Cause they have to get, I want to say it's like an inch or so deep into the muscle, maybe not that far, maybe like a centimeter deep into the muscle. Um, and they, they local anesthetic, the whole thing, like you n- don't necessarily feel it. Um, or so I'm told, but yeah. Yeah. Know, sounds awful. Sorry. A, side note. <laughs> yeah. No, they have to take a chunk. <laughs> so sorry to interrupt. I was, I tend to do that by the way. I just like think of things and say them <laughs> or else I forget. <laughs> so we got fasted fed and the nutrition and then the exercise. So doing more endurance exercise or more sprints. Do you have you, how do you research in that area and how, to, what ex- yeah. type of exercise works best intensity, frequency, duration? The most research on exercise for mitochondrial improvement is in endurance research, endurance um, training. So it's kind of mixed in terms of like, there's no, there's no singular protocol that's going to work best. It really just depends on the person. Mm -hmm. Um, So whether that be low and slow endurance or whether that be hit training for a certain amount of time, like, I think, I think the benefits of endurance training as a whole is larger than just the mitochondria. So my recommendation is always to like mix it up. You mm-hmm. know, there's, there's an importance of the more zone two, zone three, heart rate zone cardio, um, for certain benefits. And then there's other major health benefits that only occur if you tap into the zones four and five every once in a while. Yeah. So a little bit of everything is good. Yeah. Well, I've been doing a lot of podcasts on that because I bought Panoe metabolic testing kit a few months ago. And I used to do new leaf metabolic testing forever ago. And then it got bought out by lifetime fitness. So I finally have this new testing kit and it's the same thing as, you know, you identify what areas you're 
you can see I'm doing this training, but what am I not doing enough of? And then we, yeah. based on the data we collect from the metabolic test assessment and breath analysis is go, okay, you're not doing enough of zone five, which most people don't. They tend to do more zone three thinking they're doing interval training and really the zone two. So when we find out well, you need more, you know, the endurance benefit, the mitochondria benefits, it's going to be true zone two for you, the individual true zone five, which is, is so hard to do to get that high intensity. And I know Dr. Stacey Sims is all about that for females as they're pre post menopause. So if people can do metabolic tests, if they want to know how I should train, I would advise getting that information because most people do call the gray zone is that moderate intensity zone three, that is too easy to be too to be hard and too hard to be easy that you're in that in between, but you want to the gray zone or black hole training. So you want to be long and slow zone twos for mitochondria I've heard. And then four or five is that the intervals, but coming down to zone one, going back up to five or four, which I'm sure your basketball players do all the time. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. I mean, the whole sport of basketball is like, go as hard as you can for like two minutes and then they blow a whistle and then you have time to like, stop. <laughs> yeah. So it's, yeah, they definitely get a lot of that. <laughs> So, so we got the exercise part, but then what if we it, don't eat enough food to get the, you know, polyphenols and we call supplement is when we need to supplement what we're got, not getting enough of in our nutrition. And a lot of people I've been talking about, a lot of the athletes are fasting too much and not really getting their nutrition they need because we're already fit and active. So we're having more low energy availability for female athletes more so than men, I think, but I know a lot of men fasting too much. So anyways, we're not getting enough of the nutrient dense whole foods we need. And then there's a lot of people doing strict carnivore these days. It's kind of a popular trend and doing a strict food elimination. So people aren't even getting any vegetables and fruits. They're just, they're not probably getting the food. So if we need polyphenols to help with the mitochondria, the supplementation of using timelines nutrition, talk a little bit more about your approach to supplements and then into timeline nutrition's purpose and how it works for athletes and aging athletes of all levels. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's complicated. The more that we learn in this field of research, the more I recognize that things do really need to be individualized and mm -hmm. tailored to the specific person. Yes. Um, it's hard to make generalized statements anymore about much of anything. Um, oh, so my, my that's what I do. That's why we have a job, right? We're individualizing it for clients. It's not one size fits all. Exactly. So, um, my approach to supplements is first of all, why, like, why yeah. are we, what are we theoretically missing? And is there evidence to support the fact that this is actually missing from the diet, from our blood work, from our testing, like whatever, um, so then after that, it's like, okay, can we approach this from a food first perspective? You know, if I have a player that has a poor omega-3 index, I would rather them get omega-3s from seafood, chia seeds, whatever in their diet, and then retest and see if that strategy works before I just start handing out pills to people. But then if I have an athlete who hates seafood, and doesn't want a post-practice smoothie where I can sneak in chia seeds or whatever else. Oh, I need to lean towards supplementation in order to get things done. So it's kind of like, it's kind it's a, it's a tree of just like, if this, then that, if this, then that, and like make decisions that way. Um, when it comes to might appear in timeline nutrition, the interesting thing about it is so for your audience that doesn't know might appear is that your lipin a molecule I was speaking about before. And That's right. yep, exactly. And so the, the researchers who founded this company started doing research actually on pomegranates because they wanted to better understand why it was touted as this superfood that it is. Um, and what they realized or what they recognized was that the elegitanins in pomegranates can be converted into urolithin A. Um, and your A then induces that mitophagy process and improves mitochondrial health and, and, you know, that whole downstream effect. So what they did was they compared people who just drank pomegranate juice, pardon me for the notifications, they, people who drank pomegranate juice, and then they measured the amount of your A in their blood and then compared that to people who just took a dose of mitopure. 
the people, they found that only about 40% of people can actually make that gut conversion from the pomegranates into urolithin A. Um, and it all has to do with the gut microbiome diversity, but there's no specific strains that were identified because that'd be super hard to do in mm -hmm. research. But they could just see a correlation between people who had more gut microbiome diversity and those people had more urolithin A conversion. Then you compare that to just one tailored dose of Mitopur, and it was a six-fold difference of the amount of urolithin A in the system. So they kind of recognized that although it's all well and good to try to get people to eat more foods that contain elegitanins and the polyphenols, and like that's great, and that's definitely still something that I try to do in my practice, odds are good that most of the people I work with can't make that gut conversion into the metabolite that I want them to make it into. And I've, I've done a test myself to test my own natural production and I eat very well. And like, I was a crappy producer. So I'm like, okay, well, these guys that I work with who, you know, are typical Western diet eaters for sure are not good converters. Like there's no way. So that's why I just decide to supplement with Mitopur because I know then that they're getting that active metabolite. That's going to be good for their mitochondria. So go back to how do you test that if they're converting it? How do you know? So Timeline actually has, it's a running clinical trial. It's ongoing where um, people can apply to it and they send out like a blood test spot kit and you drink eight ounces of pomegranate juice, um, do a blood spot a couple hours later. And then you have a washout period. I think of it's like 48 hours maybe. And then you take one dose of Mitopure and do the same blood spot. And then you send it to the lab and then they'll compare the two. I want to do that. So- if you take, cause we have pomegranate trees at our house oh, nice. <laughs> and if we have pomegranates, how many, it's just like a, a vegan trying to get enough protein and leucine. How many yeah. pomegranates do you have to have or how much juice? Because one pomegranate has so many seeds in it. I mean, it seems like a lot of work to, to get, or you buy a bottle of juice. How much do you have to have to make it equal to this has 500 milligrams of yep. your litho than a. Yeah. About six glasses of oh. pomegranate juice. Okay. I, and that's sugary too, isn't it? So much sugar. Yeah. I would probably have a blood sugar coma <laughs> result. So, I mean, it's a natural a sugar. It's from fruit, but it's still, yeah. it's a, it's a high dose of sugar. Yeah. So that's another reason why I lean towards supplementation, because if my goal is to get your lithin A into their system to improve mitochondrial health, I can't do it through diet alone. Yeah. It's like broccoli sprouts. You know, when you take a supplement of broccoli sprouts to help for different issues that to get enough broccoli, you have to have like 10 pounds of broccoli. <laughs> so, right. That's not exact science, but same kind of concept, but okay. So doing the supplement when you, why would you do it? How would you know you need it without, if you didn't do that test and then, well, that test is if you're processing it, but how yeah. long do you take it dose? I mean, how, tell us a little bit more about function and all that. Like just two soft gels a day, who needs yeah. to take it? To me, I, I get asked a lot, like who could benefit from this? The answer is anybody with mitochondria <laughs> can benefit from it. Um, because it's funny, like even with athletes, athletes among us are probably at like the most natural mitochondrial ceiling they can be, right? Just by nature of the fact that they are constantly exercising and genetically blessed with good health, right? So beyond that, that doesn't necessarily mean they have perfect mitochondria and there isn't room for improvement um, because what your lithin A does, it just promotes a natural process that our bodies already do. So it's not introducing anything new or foreign into the system. It's just helping a natural process that already occurs. So as far as how to know if you would benefit from my, uh, might appear at all, I, I'd say, okay, people who there's, there's no exact thing to it. And everything I'm about to say could also be caused by a million different other things, but such things like, um, you know, undue fatigue is a big one. Um, muscle weakness could be a sign, um, really just, I mean, aging, like it, mm -hmm. it's just something that you don't know how much it can help you until you really give it a try. You don't know what you don't know. Correct. <laughs> Yeah. So no, exactly. So when it comes to, um, dosing, the recommended dose is 500 milligrams a day. And that's based off of our human clinical trials, um, that the, the company has run to, and they found improved muscular strength, improved muscular endurance, improved VO2 peak, 
Um, in a study with an older population, there was an improved six minute walk distance, which is um, really like practically relevant, you know? So 500 milligrams a day, um, there's the soft gels, really easy, just two soft gels can be taken fasted or fed. There's no bioavailability issues when you compare it. Like if you took it at the same time, capsules that are not giant horse pills that people kind of freak out about. No, gelatin based capsules. So they are not vegan. The capsules aren't. Um, but we also offer a food extract form, um, which it's just mixed with like, uh, berry and, um, I think it's like, yeah, I think it's like berry extract primarily mixed berries, like blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, um, still has the 500 milligrams in one dose. And that you could easily mix into a smoothie. You could, uh, I like it in my oatmeal, like, cause it's heat stable. So you could really bake it into anything. Um, and just, it's a, it's a way to have more of a food experience working this supplement into your regimen, as opposed to just a couple of pills. Yeah. So as MCT oil, sunflower, less, lecithin oil, gelatin, glycerol, purified water, glycerol, mono, stearate, red, iron oxide color. So with the gelatin, is that more the animal product? That's, the gelatin? Yeah, that's why it's not vegan. Yep. Hmm. Okay. And then the, it'd be good. Like you said, the signs and symptoms of mitochondria dysfunction are similar to adrenal fatigue too. Cause a lot of yeah. times there's research on, um, I'm forgetting the term, but the adrenal fatigue, is it really the adrenals that are fatigued or is it the mitochondria, the cell danger response? That's what I was trying to think of cell danger response that came out a few years ago. And I know Dr. Um, it's kind of thought of it, but there's great research on that. And then doc, not doctor, but Ari Witten does a lot of research on the cell danger response of mitochondria health. And so I think for athletes and especially endurance athletes, who have been doing this a long time. And my experience with adrenal exhaustion air quotes, cause it's kind of a metabolic chaos, but I think mm-hmm. a lot of it comes back to the health of the mitochondria and doing what we can do to, like we said, get rid of the old, get some new ones. Yep. It is so important to people who do care about their health and how they will be living because I'm sure mitochondria are an important part of the aging process and longevity, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. It's uh, mitochondrial dysfunction is one of the sign, like one of the hallmarks of aging for sure. Yeah. Cause that's what I keep talking about on the show is that especially my mom somehow is 82 and my dad passed away last year. And then all their friends are, you know, late seventies, early eighties and watching them that have known for 30, 40 years, what's happening to everyone. And so if people have family and friends that are older, just watch how they're aging and how so much of it can be improved if we did something now. So that makes me more passionate about, okay, what can we do now to take ownership? As we said, beginning of the show, I think is essential. Yep. Yeah. There's definitely, like I mentioned earlier, the earlier you start, the better, but it's better late than never for Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. And then the importance of you know, the two questions of the testing, the studies they de- have done, what ages have they kind of done all ages and is it on men and women? Yeah. So right now there's two primary clinical trials that have been published. One was in older adults, 65 and up, and then another was 45 to 65. Hmm. Similar results found between the two men and women, um, just generally healthy population, um, no chronic disease states, um, within that population. And what I also always say was, you know, we can't out exercise poor nutrition habits and you can't out supplement poor lifestyle habits or the exercise and nutrition part. You have to do what I call the holistic method and train the whole athlete from the inside out. So instead of people thinking they just take two of these a day, what else would you suggest to them to improve their health, to make it kind of the whole picture, the a protocol to help just improve the aging process, anti-aging longevity? Yeah, absolutely. I think that this, I think might appear is a great addition to a holistic approach on health, right? So having the appropriate diet that makes sense for you, your body, your health state, your goals, as well as exercising daily and in whatever capacity you currently can, you know, if you are someone who is completely sedentary, start slow, like Mm -hmm. just, just start, do anything. And then find a way to progress from there and, and reach out to somebody for help. Find, find someone who can help you in your journey. 
Um, so if you can find the right diet that works for you and your body, make sure you're exercising and then introduce these types of targeted nutrition based supplements, then yeah, it's definitely a great way to optimize that health span. So I've just pl pulled up the website, but timelinenutrition.com backslash science, you can see the benefits for the body. We're talking about energy, strength, endurance, optimal levels, but also benefits for skin, energy, youthfulness, resilience, gentle power. But yeah. how does it help our skin? Cause that's what I'm like, my eyes <laughs> having to wear reading glasses lately all the time. And just my skin health is really, it says the amount of collagen, how we lose it from age 30, just goes straight downhill. Yeah. So what we actually found was that urolithin A can be absorbed through the skin. Hmm. So, um, that we've done some studies to investigate just how we can affect that, um, the effect of there's, when it comes to aging of the skin, there's intrinsic and extrinsic factors. So intrinsic being just natural aging, you know, the stuff happening inside our body, the inflammation that's going to lead to potential skin effects. And then the extrinsic is, you know, sunlight damage and, you know, the weather effects and those kinds of things. So what we've seen with putting your A into a skin health line, we've seen massive improvements in just skin health overall. And so that's why you can see on the, on the website that there is a, there's a whole skin health line. There's a day cream, a night cream, and a serum. Hmm. I'll have to test that out. And it would, I, I should test it out and then stack it with my red light mask. Would that help enhance it? If you stack oh, those? I mean, <laughs> theoretically, yeah. Cause red light's supposed to help the mitochondria as well. So yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't see why not. We just don't have any research on it. I'll do my own study. It's this area under here my under eyes, <laughs> I am on a mission to reverse. I don't think you have to have it <laughs> saggy, puffy under eyes wrinkles. So anyways, enough about me, but just the importance of people wanting to, you know, lose fat and they're exercising. They can't lose fat weight and they can't get faster, get strength, get power. This could help maybe because their workouts, if they add this into their nutrition exercise lifestyle protocol as an additional supplementing what they're already doing that in theory should end result, help them improve their fat metabolism in a way or burning more fat in their workouts because they're able to have more energy to work out. Uh, yeah. So in a, in an indirect way, yes. Your A is not going to specifically burn more fat. No. Um, that's not what it does as a metabolite, but it improves mitochondrial health and mitochondria are the place in which fat is burned. So, um, it kind of can help in an indirect way, but at the end of the day, like you just said, it's going to help, ha it's going to help a person have more energy to be able to put more into their workouts so mm -hmm. that the actual calories burned at the end of the workout can be higher because they were able to work harder or work longer or something like that. Um, some other like anecdotal reports we've gotten from people, myself included, when I first started taking might appear, um, one of the things that a lot of people noted was just better recovery from their workouts. Mm -hmm. So if you have, if you're feeling better and you have less downtime in between your workouts, it just over time that accumulates into just furthering you towards your goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm just breaking up. Cause I always talk about fat loss, performance and longevity, but the fat loss, I think, because It'd be interesting because I have that Panoe metabolic testing kit measure resting metabolism. If it changes having more improved mitochondria health, if that changes your fat to carb burn fuel source in a testing and then during exercise test, if it just, uh, you can't really tell if it, what you never know all of it together yeah. combined. <laughs> you know what? Why don't you do that? And let us know. <laughs> I'll do my own study. Got that in the skincare with my red light mask. So, and then for performance, we're talking about how just indirectly, again, it would be able to give you more energy because mitochondria are just healthier, more robust, and maybe more of them. So you can do a proper zone two. And then the days that you should do when you're ready to do a sprint interval training, that zone five to zone two, 10 to 30 second sprints, would it help performance? So you can go harder in an indirect way to improve mitochondria health doing the interval training. Yeah, it's just, it's just going to give more overall energy and better, you know, vitality and yeah. from the cellular level. Yep. And then longevity, we talked about too, just, I think that, that's the biggest thing I think athletes forget about is they're just focused on training day to day and what races or events or sporting 
commitments they have and not thinking when the season's over or how they're going to be next year. And they just kind of are day to day. So how do you get your, especially younger age athletes thinking, okay, when you're retired from basketball and you got to think of your next phase in life, what are you going to do to be your best self? A lot of my guys, uh, I try to remind them like the younger guys, I'm like, how long of a career do you want to have in the NBA? Do you want to just play for the average, like two, three seasons, or do you want to have these 14, 15 plus year careers that some of these guys do? Mm-hmm. And they're always like, I want to play for as long as I can. Okay. Well, the, that will happen or like you can play for longer if you start taking care of yourself now and not just waiting for your body to deteriorate from all the stress that you put on it. Mm-hmm. For my older guys, it's kind of hard to have a conversation with someone about their life after they're done playing, when they're still playing. So it's still kind of the same messaging of like, here are tools that I think will help extend your career, but also just make you feel better right now. Because the older guys are the ones who feel crappier on a day-to-day basis because they just, they don't recover as well. And they, you know, they just have these, this accumulated stress on their body from playing in in the league for so many years. So those guys, it's more of like, here's how this can help you right now and make you feel better right now. And then when you're done playing, happy to have a conversation with you about how to move forward and not like, you know, gain a bunch of weight and become a metabolic mess. Yeah. Transition phase from one life to the next. So what do you suggest for athletes in recovery or more your specialties, basketball players? So what is recovery to you for helping people nutritionally supplements, lifestyle? Yeah. So number one, sleep, uh, Mm -hmm. sleep is is the most important thing that they can do for their bodies. Um, number two, I, I encourage them to just maintain some sort of, depending on like where we are in the season, like if they're just coming off a back-to-back, I don't care if they don't get out of bed the next day. Like, Really, I mean, they, they need to be eating something, but if they don't go for a walk, I'm fine with it. But if we have a few days in between and like, they're not practicing or whatever, I'm like, get up and go for a walk, keep your body moving. Um, don't do anything too stressful or maybe get on a bike. So you save the, you know, the load that goes on your knees, but kind of building up that resilience, um, to all of the training load that they're put under nutritionally. Mm-hmm. I am, I am like the fruit and vegetable pusher. I'm constantly, following them on the buffet line. And I'm like, Hey, uh, you want to add some more color to that plate? You know? And I'll like, Oh, I'll, I've like called across the dining room. I'm like, Hey, how many colors you got on your plate today? Like Mm -hmm. it's it's really as simple as they're going to, they're going to eat the protein. They're going to eat the carbohydrates. Like that's what they know and love because that's the population I work with. But so if I can emphasize the fruits and vegetables to them, I might be able to get somewhere with just that natural food intake. And then on top of that, they're primarily bought into tart cherry juice. Um, that's a pretty easy one to push. I'll make post-practice smoothies for them where I add in as many fruits and vegetables as I possibly can, as, lo- as well as the protein that they need to recover. Um, and then they have options of like hot tub, cold tub. We have red light therapy. They do a lot of treatment with our physical therapists and our uh, manual therapists. So they have just about every possible resource that they that they could have. Mm-hmm. Did you ever use, do you ever use bone broth? I know Dr. Kate Shanahan used to work with the Lakers and got Kobe Bryant and all these people eating more, drinking more bone broth and healing foods. Yeah. There's usually a point in the winter when, uh, once we kind of start seeing people start to get sick a little bit, or somebody's feeling down, got the cold or whatever, our, our chef will whip up a, a batch of bone broth and have it available for people. Yeah. I like to call it healing broth rather than bone broth. So people that are afraid that I'm going to suck on a bone. <laughs> so it's good sounding. So what are your take then on the, the whole other side of the industry is carnivore plant toxins and, you know, looking at that side, what's your take on that as your philosophy as a dietitian? I think it's wild. <laughs> um, honestly, I have not seen so all right, let me back up. <laughs> There's definitely no general consensus in terms of like large nutrition agency supporting that kind of diet, supporting a carnivore diet. The, I mean, the idea of plant toxicity is kind of wild to me. Just, I mean, theoretically you can have a toxic level of just about anything. So I'm not going to write it off completely, but I think the amount that of, of plants that you'd have to eat to get to that point is above and beyond what 
is ever going to happen. I mean, I've personally never heard of somebody dying from eating too many plants, but um, I am not, I'm not super well versed in the research, but what I do know is that consuming a carnivore diet of only animal products of only meats and stuff. I, I cannot see that being healthy in the long term. For your microbiome. Yeah. It's diversity. Just, well, yeah. And, and how many nutrients you're missing out on by only consuming those products. It's in the same way that I wouldn't promote a diet that's only fruits and vegetables because you can't get every nutrient that you need by sticking to just kind of one category of food. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's why people to make carnivore work have to do the, the nose to tell and eat the organ meat, which is not really pleasant for most of us. <laughs> well, and even there, like you're, you're still not going to get everything. Like you're, you're just, you're just not. So I, I don't anticipate, I think carnivore diet from my understanding, which again, I haven't looked into it super hard because I just look at it as like a fad. I think it's something that is spicy to talk about. And, um, I'm sure there are people saying that they do it and they feel great and whether or not that's the whole truth, I have no idea. Um, but if it is great, but talk to me in 20 years doing that. Yeah. I think it's just variety of everything and rotating your foods and mixing things up is the spice of life for everything is just don't do the same thing day after day, your workout, your nutrition, your fasting, everything should be variations. Exactly. Mix it up. I I like to surprise my body. Yeah. (laughs) What are we going to do today? I don't know. I know it is good. So what kind of, do you do any lab testing with people? You mentioned blood work. Do you do any labs or gut microbiome testing, gut health? Yeah, we, for those that opt into it, yes, we'll do. So everybody gets the standard blood panel, um, that we use through the, the university hospital near us. Um, and then on top of that, they have options to do stool testing, um, other urine tests, omega tests, um, genetic tests. They, they kind of have just about anything that they want. Yeah. It's kind of wet wild health program. I know they work with athletes. One side of the program does all the different testing and that's what I kind of, find I'm doing more as a health investigator is take all that information together. And then as you were saying before, it's not one size fits all. It's very personalized. when you get all that data from the hidden internal sources of chronic stress and possible imbalances, dysfunction, it's really, I always think fun putting the missing pieces of the puzzle together, figure out how you can perform your best. Well, here we've got all this information. Let's do this protocol and reset your gut and do all that. So what is your next kind of focus area? Do you work with timeline? What else is on your plate? I'm prepping for this next NBA season. We start in just a few weeks. Um, we'll have training camp. So I'm, I'm basically full tilt ahead into just NBA season. And then with timeline, um, we're always popping up at different shows. I think we're going to A4M in December. Mm -hmm. There's there's like a women's biohacking one in November. I forget the name of, mm-hmm. um, we'll be at Fency, which is the Academy of Nutrition Dietetics, um, annual conference. And then next year, metabolic health summit, ACSM, you know, a lot of these shows that we, we try to get in and give lectures, um, at, because as, as your audience now knows, the story of might appear is a long one and a complicated one. Um, so doing what we can to explain it to the general public, because we do truly believe this is like, this is pretty impactful. This is something that can definitely help people's lives. Um, so yeah, just trying to do what I can to get the word out. Yeah. I think it's important. And what we talked about before is why, why are you taking this? Do you need this? And mitochondria help because I get people that listen to all these podcasts and YouTube videos and blogs, and they end up having, I said in the intro before you came on that everyone's having, you know, 50 different supplements in their cabinet. And then they come to me with this long list and it's more looking at, okay, what's this for? Why are you taking this? When are you taking it? And I think it's getting the need for people to get a personalized program, working with a coach or practitioner to figure out what is best for them at this moment. And would you do this on and off? I was going to ask that cycle it in and out, or is it something most people always need if they're an athlete? There, we haven't done a periodization study. Um, I personally have cycled on and off of it and didn't notice much of a difference when I cycled off, but I only cycled off for a few months. So, uh, the way, the way that the supplement itself works is you kind of need to saturate the cells with your lithin A for an extended period of time to really have 
the tangible outcomes. Mm -hmm. So in our clinical trials, it took our, our endpoints were, um, I think it was four weeks and there weren't any significant changes, but then at eight weeks is when we saw mm -hmm. the significant improvements in the muscular strength and muscular endurance. So that's why we always recommend and why on our website, we sell it in one month, two month, four and 12 month, um, packs, because this is, it's a longevity supplement. It's not something that it's not like caffeine. That's going to provide you with instant stimulation. This is something that you need to saturate the body with first in order to see that kind of downstream effect. And that's in the clinical trials in, in the anecdotal reports, uh, we've had people say that they feel better within like two weeks was, is, you know, their sleep improved or, you know, just general, um, cognition improved, uh, better, you know, endurance in their workouts, better recovery from their workouts, all of that kind of stuff. So it's, it's definitely individual, but we recommend people try it at least for two months before giving it like the full write off. If they feel like they haven't yeah. felt anything in a day, you know, that's so common. Be like, I don't feel anything. This doesn't working. Like how long you've been on it? Two weeks. Yeah. Have you been taking exactly. it every day? No. <laughs> Yeah. And I, then I question that person's motivation for taking it. Like, well, were you looking for a magic pill? Cause that doesn't exist. But if you're willing to put in the time and effort for this, it will benefit you. Yeah, for sure. And that's why, you know, we're talking about exercise too. You can't just, I think you get more results if you do the exercise program with it than someone that's sedentary sitting on the sofa. Yeah. And it's just to help their mitochondria, which maybe it helps a little bit, but it could help so much more if they put the work in. Absolutely. Like Ozempic and all the other stuff out there. It's like, it's, you gotta actually do the work. <laughs> Exercise yeah. doesn't come in a pill. <laughs> nope. <laughs> so awesome. Well, where can people learn more? We said the website, where else should we send them to learn more about you? MitoPure? Yeah. TimelineNutrition.com is the best way to learn more about MitoPure. Um, my own I don't really have a great like businessy. Yeah, Instagram. you're busy. Yeah, my Instagram's a personal one, but people are welcome to follow me at Emily Werner 34. Um, my LinkedIn has all of my information as far as my experience, but um, working on a website. So I, I'll uh, I'll let you know when that launches. Well, I think that's when you're done working as a team dietitian for Philadelphia 76ers. There's not really time to time or need. So. Again, less is more is my mantra. Don't do the stuff you don't need to do right now. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you so much for your knowledge and sharing some information on uh, how we can improve our future self and improve our performance of the athletes now, but also, you know, we should be hopefully striving to live our best life today and 10, 30, 40 years from now. <laughs> 100%. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks.